Okay, so there's a lot to talk about in this video, so I'm just going to go ahead and get started. Uh, the first thing I decided to talk about was linear independence. So here I've drawn a couple of pictures, and let's just kind of run through each of the pictures and what's going on in each of them. So here we have a picture with two vectors u and v, and in this picture, our two vectors are going to span a plane. Uh, a plane we can think of as being a two-dimensional object, uh, since planes have a notion of like area to them. Now, if we go on to this next picture over here, so again, we have two vectors, but this time the two vectors are collinear. And because they are collinear, they end up spanning only a line rather than a plane. Uh, a line intuitively is a one-dimensional object because uh, it only has uh, links to it, but no area. In this third picture here, I don't think it's too important, but I thought I would mention it anyways. Uh, for the special case where both of the vectors are the zero vector, uh, then they would only span uh, a point, just the origin. Uh, a point is essentially a zero-dimensional object. Okay. So here we've got two vectors, and they will either span two dimensions, or one, or zero. Those are the only possibilities. If we have three vectors now, so three vectors can span a three-dimensional space, uh, as would be the case in this picture. It's maybe not too clear, but I try to draw it so that W is sticking out above the plane spanned by U and V. So in this case, uh, U, V, W, they span three dimensions. Uh, in this picture over here, uh, I tried to depict vectors u, v, and w as being coplanar. So think of w as being in the plane spanned by u and v. In this case, the three vectors will only span uh, two dimensions, a plane. And of course, if all three vectors lie on a single line, so if they're all collinear, then they would only span one dimensions, so just one line, one dimension. Uh, I didn't uh, write it down, but if u, v, w were all equal to the zero vector, then again, they would only span a point, which would be zero dimensions. Okay. So with two vectors, they will span two, one, or zero dimensions. With three vectors, they can span three, two, one, or zero dimensions. Okay. Dimension is something that uh, we're going to talk more about in this class uh, later on. Uh, sometime after the first exam, uh, we'll talk more about dimension. Uh, that being said, I wanted to give a definition of linear independence, which uh, involves this intuitive idea of dimension. So here's the definition that I have. So k vectors, so some number k, all right? For some number k, uh, k vectors are linearly independent if they span k dimensions. Otherwise, they will span less than k dimensions, and they would be considered linearly dependent if that were the case. Okay. So this is kind of an intuitive geometric definition of linear independence. So just kind of going back to these pictures right now. In this case, we have two vectors, which span two dimensions. So in this picture, u and v would be linearly independent. Uh, however, if we have two vectors spanning less than two dimensions, uh, then they're going to be linearly dependent. So that would be the case in this picture, because the two vectors span less than two dimensions. 
Likewise here, uh, U and V would also be linearly dependent. Okay. When we have three vectors, they're going to be linearly independent if they span three dimensions, as in this first picture with UBW. But in these other pictures, where the three vectors do not span three dimensions, they span less than three dimensions, they are going to be linearly dependent. Okay? All right, excuse me. Okay, so that's kind of a nice uh, way of thinking about linear independence. But now uh, let's consider this example that I have prepared down here. So now we're given these three vectors, v1, v2, v3. Rather than having a picture of them, uh, we just have their components. So we just have a bunch of numbers, if you will. And let's say we wanted to decide or figure out whether these three vectors are linearly independent. So without a picture, it's kind of hard to use this definition here to determine if they are independent or not. So it's going to be useful for us to have a more algebraic definition of linear independence as well. So that is what I provide down below over here. So again, let's say that we have k vectors, v1 through vk. So these k vectors, they are linearly independent. If the only solution to this equation here, where we have a linear combination set equal to 0, if the only solution to this equation is this trivial solution, where all the coefficients are 0, uh, then these vectors are linearly independent. Otherwise, they would be linearly dependent. Okay. okay. Now, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into how this algebraic definition is equivalent to this geometric definition. But I will say that any set of vectors which are linearly independent according to this definition will be linearly independent according to this definition as well, and vice versa. Any vectors which are linearly independent according to this definition will end up spanning k dimensions, meaning that they would be linearly independent according to this definition. These two definitions, they look different, but they are actually equivalent to each other. Okay. Now, the advantage to this more algebraic definition of linear independence, though, is that uh, it's much easier to use to solve an example like the one that we have here. So I'm going to try to illustrate uh, how it works. What we want to do is we want to start to check if these three vectors are independent. We want to start by setting up an equation like this. So I'm going to start by just forming a combination of these three vectors. So we're going to take C1 times V1 plus C2 times V2 plus C3 times V3. And we're going to set that combination equal to 0 right now. Note that is a 0 vector, so we'd be setting it equal to 0, 0, 0 in the example. OK. And what we want to do is we want to look at this equation and we want to figure out whether the only solution is that C1, C2, and C3 
are all zero. All right, so this equation here, if we read off uh, each of the components, okay, we're going to end up with a system of equations. So we're going to get one equation is 1c1 plus 0c2 plus 1c3 equals 0. Okay. Looking at the second component of both sides, we're going to get minus c1 plus c2 plus 0c3 equals 0. That's just looking at the second component. And then looking at the third component, 1c1 plus 2c2 plus 1c3 is 0. OK? All right. So now we want to try to solve this system of equations. Okay. And if we get that c1, c2, and c3 must be 0, that means that our three vectors are linearly independent. Otherwise, they would be linearly dependent. Okay. Now, uh, we will be getting more into how to solve these systems of equations in a systematic fashion. Uh, that will probably be in the next review video. So for now, I'm just going to uh, mess around uh, doing some elimination or substitution uh, just to try to solve for C1, C2, and C3. Uh, again, we'll learn how to solve these more systematically uh, very shortly in the future. Okay. Now to start with, uh, I noticed that equations one and three both have C1 plus C3 in them. So if we subtract equation 3 minus equation 1, this C1 minus C1, they're going to cancel out. We'll get C3 minus C3. Those will also cancel. So they'll be, we'll be left with a 2C2 equals on the other side 0 minus 0, so it's still equal to 0 on the right. And from that, we immediately get that C2 is equal to 0. OK? Now that we know C2 is equal to 0, if we go back to the second equation, we have negative C1 plus C2 is 0. And because we know that C2 itself is 0, we immediately conclude that C1 is equal to 0. OK? Let's see here. I'm going to move these up a little bit. OK. And then now knowing that C1 is equal to 0, if we go back to equation 1, where we have C1 plus C3 is 0, and we just found that C1 is 0, uh, that tells us that therefore C3 is equal to 0. So in this case, we see that C1, C2, and C3 are all 0. So by our definition of linear independence over here. Since we found that c1, c2, c3 must be 0, therefore our vectors are linearly independent. Okay, So that will be the sort of final answer for this example. OK. Let's just do one more example. So again, I've got three vectors here, and then we want to check if they are going to be linearly independent or not. 
So we're going to approach it the same way. We're going to form a combination of V1, V2, V3. Uh, instead of using C1, C2, C3, you know, you can use any letters you really want. So I'm going to use X, Y, Z this time. So I'm going to have uh, X times V1 plus Y times V2 plus Z times V3. For linear independence, we set it equal to the zero vector. And now we need to try to solve for x, y, and z. And once again, if we find that x, y, and z must all be 0, then these three vectors are linearly independent. Uh, if it is not the case that x, y, and z must be all 0, then they are linearly dependent. Okay. So. I'm going to go ahead and convert this into a system of equations. So reading off the first uh, row, if you will, we have 1x1 plus 0y plus 1z. So just 1x plus 0y plus 1z equal to 0. Next, we're going to have minus x plus 1y plus 0z zero is 0. And lastly, 1x plus 2y plus 3z equals 0. OK, uh, this time let's try something different. So. Uh, this time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve for x in, actually, no. I'm going to solve for z in the first equation. So if I just move the x to the other side, we find that z is equal to negative x. In the second equation, I'm going to solve for y. So I'm going to move minus x to the other side, and that will give us y equals x. Okay. So now I'm going to take both of these, and I'm going to substitute into the third equation. So if I do that, the third equation becomes x plus 2y. And here I'm going to substitute x for y, since y is equal to x. And then we have plus 3z. And here, z is equal to negative x, so I'm going to Substitute negative x in for z. OK. Now, when we do that, uh, notice uh, here we get x plus 2x, which is 3x. And then here we have minus 3x equal to 0, which leaves us with uh, 0 equals 0. OK. OK, so oh, and here it might be worth um, emphasizing. So 3x minus 3x leaves us with 0x in particular. So let me maybe add that x in there just to uh, try to make uh, what's going on a bit more clear. Okay. Well, in this case, what's going on? So uh, in the last example, we were able to get that C1, C2, and C3 were all equal to 0. Here, we're getting something different. After substituting equations 1 and 2 into the third equation, we get down to this point where 0x equals 0. And notice in this equation, x could actually be any number. OK, so in particular, x is not forced to be equal to 0. So as an example, uh, x equals 1. 
would still satisfy this equation since you're multiplying x by zero. So no matter what x is, it's always going to be equal to zero. Now if x is equal to one, we have these two equations here, which tell us what y and z are going to be. So with x being equal to one, that means that y would be equal to one as well, and z would equal to negative one. So here, uh, we are finding some non-zero solutions uh, to the system of equations. Oops, dang it, okay. So we have non-zero solutions this time. And just to kind of double check this. Uh, let's plug these numbers into our equation just to confirm that uh, it does give us a solution. So I'm going to take uh, this equation over here and I'm going to plug in one for x. I'm going to plug in one for y. And I'm going to plug in negative one for z. And if you uh, add everything up over here, here we get 1 plus 0 minus 1, which is 0. Negative 1 plus 1 minus 0. And then 1 plus 2 minus 3. So in fact, it does give us a solution. So what's the takeaway from this? Well, to be linearly independent, the only solution must be that the coefficients are zero. That's what it means to be independent. But here we found non-zero solutions. So the takeaway would be that these vectors are linearly dependent, okay? All right, so if you have a question like this and you get to a point where you're not definitively able to uh, say that your variables are equal to zero, and instead you kind of get something weird like a zero equals zero, uh, that's a good sign that uh, your vectors are probably linearly dependent, okay? Because uh, you're gonna have uh, some non-zero solutions. Uh, we'll definitely talk more about uh, this situation where you're getting uh, non-zero solutions uh, later in the future when we talk more about how to solve these systems of equations in a more systematic fashion. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and just move on to the next topic. So next, I want to talk a bit about the uh, norm of a vector. Okay. So there are other words uh, that are in use aside from the word norm. So I guess like other synonyms are length and magnitude. Uh, I've also heard people use the word modulus before, uh, but length, magnitude, modulus, norm, they all kind of refer to the same thing, okay? Now, uh, the notation for the norm of a vector. Uh, so there's two common notations. One is a notation that kind of looks like absolute value. And then we also have a notation where it uses like double bars. So it's kind of like a double absolute value, okay? Uh, just to save myself a little bit of writing, I will be using the sort of absolute value notation. Although I am aware that uh, in your assignment, at least, that the double bar notation is used instead, all right? So don't get confused, though. 
when I'm using a single bar and your assignment is using double bar, but we're talking about the same thing, we're talking about the norm of a vector. And the norm of a vector, if you're visualizing the vector as an arrow, uh, the norm does refer to the length of the vector, okay? So here I've got a couple of pictures. So let's start with this picture here in R2. I have drawn a vector x with components x1 and x2. So x1 is like the x component, x2 is the y component. And you'll notice that uh, vector x makes a right triangle here. And so if we, and x1 and x2 would then be the lengths of these two edges. X1 is the x-coordinate, so it's the distance along the x-axis. X2, the y-coordinate, is the distance along the y-direction. And if we apply the Pythagorean theorem, uh, Pythagorean theorem says x1 squared plus x2 squared will equal the length of x squared. Okay. So therefore, the length of x would be the square root of x1 squared plus x2 squared. Okay. So here in R2, at least, we have this formula for the length or the norm of a vector. If we move up a dimension into R3, uh, we have a similar formula for the norm. So I've drawn a picture, uh, and we're just going to uh, see how the norm works in three dimensions. So here I've drawn the x-axis. This is the y-axis. And then here we've got the z-axis. Uh, and here I've drawn a vector in blue with components x1. So it goes out like x1 units along the x-axis. Y component of x2. So it kind of goes out uh, in the y direction, x2 units. The z component is x3, because it's going up in the z direction, uh, x3 units altogether. Okay. And just like in... Uh, two dimensions and three dimensions, we can form a right triangle with this vector x. So the base of this right triangle, I've labeled it as a vector v in green in this picture. And then here, the height of the right triangle, the height is uh, parallel to the z-axis. Okay. And then we've got a nice right angle there. And if we apply the Pythagorean theorem, so the length of v squared plus the height x3 squared should equal the length of the hypotenuse, which would be the length of x squared. So hence, we have the length of the norm of x is the square root of the norm of v squared plus x3 squared. Now vector v is in the xy plane. So if I were to focus just on what's going on in the xy plane here, so here's vector v, and essentially vector v has an x component of x1 and a y component of x2. So again, we can use the Pythagorean theorem and say that x1 squared plus x2 squared is the norm of v squared. Okay, so once again, just using the Pythagorean theorem. And if we substitute this for the norm of v into this equation, we find that in R3, the norm of a vector x is the square root of the sum of the squares of its components, x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared. Okay. Now, although we can't, or at least I can't really 
uh, draw a good picture necessarily in dimensions higher than three. Uh, but you can maybe imagine that we can make a similar argument using the Pythagorean theorem. So in general, for uh, any number of dimensions n, uh, if we have a vector x in Rn, so it has n components, x1 through xn. The norm of x is defined to be the square root of the sum of the squares of its components. So I'll do a short example, but just before that, I wanted to highlight one property of the norm here. So here we have the norm of Cx, where C is a scalar, is equal to the absolute value of C times the norm of x. Okay, So this is one of the properties of the norm. Uh, there are others, but this is the only one that I thought I would uh, highlight in the uh, video. This is a property that uh, you guys already know, because this is something that we talked about when we went over scalar multiplication of vectors last time. But for instance, we know that when we multiply a vector by two, that scales its length by a factor of two. Uh, same if we multiply the vector by, by like negative two, its length would also scale by a factor of two, and the negative would just reverse the direction. That is essentially what this property is saying. If we scale a vector by some scalar c, its length gets scaled by a factor of absolute value of c. Okay? So again, that's something that you guys are already familiar with. So just a quick example. Here is a vector x with components negative 2, 0, 3, 5. So it's a vector in R4. If we wanted to compute the norm of x, according to our formula, it's the square root of the sum of the squares of its components. Okay. All right, so if we add all of that up, it's 4 plus 9 is 13 plus 25, so I think that's the square root of 38. Okay. Now, let's say that we wanted to find a vector with a norm or a length of 1 uh, pointing in the same direction as vector x. Okay. So, since vector x has a length of square root of 38, if I were to scale x by a factor of 1 over root 38, then this would now give me a vector of length 1. And since I was scaling x by a positive scalar, it still points in the same direction. So a lot of people will use um, a hat notation like that uh, whenever they are dealing with a vector whose norm or whose length is equal to 1. Okay? Vectors with a length of 1 are called unit vectors. Okay? So vectors whose norm equals 1 are called unit vectors. Okay. So whenever you hear anyone talk about a unit vector, they mean that vector has a length or a norm equal to 1. Okay. And this process of taking a vector and dividing it by its norm or its length to get a unit vector. Uh, this process has a name, we call it uh, normalization. 
So to normalize a vector, Uh, means to divide that vector okay, by its norm uh, to get a unit vector uh, pointing in the same direction. So the fact that the process of dividing a vector by its norm to get a unit vector in the same direction, the fact that that has a name to it suggests that it's a pretty important thing uh, that people often do. So I did want to just uh, highlight that, okay? And then just to round things off, if I uh, wanted to do something a bit unconventional and Let's say I wanted to find a vector with a length of 7 in the opposite direction of vector x. What I could do is take the vector x hat. So it has a length of 1 pointing in the same direction. What I'd want to do is multiply it by negative 7. So the negative makes the point in the opposite direction now. And multiplying by 7 will scale its length from 1 to 7. Okay. So then this would be uh, the vector that we are looking for with a length of 7, but in the opposite direction of the original vector x. Okay. So that's all that I have to say about the norm for now. So I'm going to go on to the next topic, which is the dot product. Let me scroll all the way up. OK. So we've talked about how to add two vectors, and we've talked about how to multiply a vector with a scalar. Now we are going to talk about one way of multiplying two vectors. OK? Uh, so this would be the dot product. Uh, if we have two vectors, u and v, vec the vectors must have the same number of components to them. Okay. We define the dot product of u and v by the following formula here. So we multiply the corresponding components of the vectors, so u1, v1, u2, v2, and so forth, and then we add everything up. So it's pretty simple. here. Just to illustrate using an example with numbers, we've got these two vectors u and v. These are vectors in R4 with four components. So the dot product, we're going to take 1 times 2 plus, and then next we're going to take 0 times 4 plus, next it's going to be negative 3 times 1 plus, and then last we're going to have 2 times negative 2. Okay. So that's going to be 2 plus 0 minus 3, so that's negative 1, and then minus 4 for a total of negative 5, okay? So that would be the dot product of these two vectors, u and v. Okay. Uh, I'll make a quick note that the dot product of two vectors results in a number, so it results in a scalar. Uh, sometimes people will refer to the dot product as the scalar product because of that. And you might be wondering, you know, what is the point of the dot product? And so it turns out that the dot product contains a wealth of geometric information. And I'm going to elaborate on 
what that means uh, for the next, uh, I don't know, 20-ish minutes or so. <laughs> so to start with, uh, I want to just make a quick connection between the dot product and the norm, which we just talked about. So if we have a vector x with uh, components x1 through xn, so we just talked about how the norm of x is the square root of x1 squared plus and so on down to xn squared. On the other hand, if you were to compute the dot product between x and itself, it would be x1 times x1 plus x2 times x2, etc., down to plus xn times xn. So in other words, x dot x would be the sum of the squares of its components. So looking at x dot uh, with itself, comparing it to the norm of x, you should notice that the norm of x is equal to the square root of x dot product with itself. Or you can also say that the norm of x squared is equal to x dot product with itself. Okay. So these equations establish a connection between the norm and the dot product. That's a very good relationship to keep in mind between the two. I will be using this fact a couple of times uh, throughout this video. Okay. So uh, namely, a vector x dot product with itself gives you its norm squared. Okay. So in that sense, the dot product can give us information about the length or the norm of a vector. And before I uh, elaborate more on how the dot product contains a lot of geometric uh, information, I first need to go over some of the algebraic properties of the dot product. So here I have listed a couple of properties. Uh, the first two properties basically say that the dot product is distributive. So u dot product with v plus w gives us, or is equal to u dot product with v plus u dot product with w. So it's like we're just distributing the dot product into the parentheses. Likewise, uh, u dot product with, or sorry, u plus v dot product with w. You can distribute the w so you get like u dot w plus v dot w, okay? Uh, another property of dot product is the ability to pull scalars out to the front. So if I have a uh, vector cu dot product with v, we can actually pull the c outside and it's equal to c times the dot product between u and v. And the same goes for if we have u dot product with cv, we can also pull the c out to the front and that would be equal to c times the dot product, okay? Uh, maybe I'll actually add one more property, which is, is kind of obvious, but I guess it's worth maybe writing it down explicitly. Uh, u dot v is the same as v dot u, okay? So uh, you could say the dot product is commutative. Uh, most people use the word symmetric as well uh, for a name of this property here. Uh, if that wasn't clear, if you just go back to the definition of u dot v for a moment, you know, interchanging u and v everywhere will still produce the same result. So v dot u is the same as u dot v. And I want to do one example, kind of highlighting uh, how these properties can be used. Okay. 
So let's suppose that we have two vectors u and v, and we are given that the norm of vector u is equal to 4. The norm of vector v is equal to 3. And we are also given that the dot product between u and v is equal to negative 2. So I'm not telling you anything about the components of u and v. So all we know is the norm of u and v as well as their dot product. And with that, we want to compute the norm of 2u minus 3v. Okay. So at first glance, it might seem like we don't have enough information to do this computation. Uh, however, it turns out that we can uh, answer this problem. So I'm going to show you guys how it works. It's a little bit tricky. okay? But what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the norm of 2u minus 3v squared. okay? Okay. And the reason why I'm going to look at the norm squared is because I'm going to exploit this property that I just mentioned earlier. How uh, the norm of a vector squared is equal to that vector dot product with itself. So here, 2u minus 3v is norm squared is equal to 2u minus 3v and then dot product with itself. Okay. All right, so again, we're just using the fact that the norm of a vector squared is equal to that vector dot product with itself. Okay. Now, when we have an, a dot product expression like the one that we have here. Uh, something that we can do is we can foil this expression out. Okay. So the fact that we can foil a dot product like this is a consequence of these various properties that I've listed here. So for instance, uh, if we foil this, we're going to get 2u dot product with 2u. which we can say is 4 times u dot product with itself. Next, we're going to get 2u dot product with minus 3v. We can pull the 2 and then minus 3 out to the front and write it as minus 6 times u dot v. And then after distributing that 2u to everything, now if we distribute this minus 3v, we're going to have minus 3v dot 2u, which would be minus 6v dot u. And then lastly, minus 3v dot product with minus 3v for a total of plus 9v dot v. Okay, so I hope you guys saw how all of that worked. Here I'll do some steps of simplification now. So u dot product with itself is equal to the norm of u squared. Okay, again, using this property that we talked about earlier. 
u.v and v.u are the same thing. So we can combine these to get minus 12 u.v. And then over here, v dot product with itself is the norm of v squared. If we plug in the numbers that we were given in the problem now, the norm of u is 4. So this is 4 squared, which is 16. u dot product with v was given to be negative 2. And the norm of v was 3. So this would be 3 squared, which is 9. Okay. And just crunching the numbers here, that's 64 plus 24 is 88 plus 81 is 169. Okay. Okay. Uh, no, that's right. That's right. Yeah, it is 169. Okay. Well, uh, so then that was the norm of 2u minus 3b all squared. So to finish the problem off, we would just need to square root that. But, oh, geez. So the norm of 2u minus 3b would be the square root of 169. Because again, this was the norm squared, so square rooting it now. And amazingly enough, that is just 13. Okay. All right. So that was a little example highlighting some of the properties of the dot product. Uh, and in particular, it's, it was worth noting that uh, we are able to foil uh, expressions involving the dot product, like the one that we have here. Okay. All right. So with that out of the way, I want to continue talking more about the dot product. So the dot product gives us information about the angle between two vectors. Now first, uh, if we have two vectors u and v, uh, as I have drawn here, uh, in a sense there is uh, two or there are two angles that we could associate uh, as being like between u and v. There is this angle here, which I've called data. There is another angle here uh, that we could consider as being the angle between u and v. But when we talk about the angle between two vectors in this class, we are always referring to the smaller of these two angles. So meaning we'd be referring to data specifically in this picture. And because we always refer to the smaller of these two angles, uh, the angle between any two vectors will always be between 0 and pi radians altogether. OK? OK. Now to uh, make the connection between the dot product and the angle between two vectors, uh, I'm going to reference the law of cosines. So as a refresher, uh, if we have a triangle like this, we have this angle data, and let's say the lengths of these edges are A, B, C. So the law of cosines says that uh, if you take the side opposite the angle data, so in this case, that's going to be C. So it says that C squared is equal to A squared plus B squared minus 2AB cosine data. Okay, So that was the law of cosines. So now I'm going to apply the law of cosines to pretty much the uh, exact same picture here, except I've made the edges of the triangle vectors. 
So this will be vector u. This will be vector v. And uh, I talked about in the uh, previous video that this vector connecting from v to u would be the vector u minus v. So applying the law of cosines to this picture, uh, so c would be the length or the norm of u minus v. So the norm u minus v squared. V. Uh, a squared would now refer to the norm of u squared. Okay. Uh, b squared now refers to the norm of v. That's norm of v squared. And then we have minus 2 a b cosine theta. Okay. So that's just from the law of cosines. Now, on the other hand, though, we can also say that the norm of u minus v squared is equal to u minus v dot product with itself. So here I am using that property once again, that the norm of a vector squared equals that vector dot product with itself. And now, just as I did in the example, I am actually going to FOIL this expression out. So if we FOIL it, we're going to get u dot product with itself. And remember, u dot product with itself is the norm of u squared. We're going to have minus u dot v minus v dot u for a total of minus 2 u dot v. And then at the end, we get uh, minus v dot product with minus v, which gives us plus v dot v, or plus the norm of v squared. OK? So now we have two equivalent expressions for the norm of u minus v squared. So if these two expressions are equal, well, okay, so since these are both expressions for the norm of u minus v squared, they must be equal to each other. And comparing the two of them, if they are equal to each other, that means that, in particular, you know, everything in the formulas matches up except for uh, these two parts, which I've underlined in blue. So for everything to be equal, these two parts must equal each other. In other words, we get this formula that u dot v must be equal to the length of u times the length of v times the cosine of the angle between them. So this gives us a sort of geometric formula for the dot product between two vectors. Okay. So the definition that I gave earlier was more of an algebraic formula, where you multiply the components of u and v and add all those products up. Here we've got another formula that does not reference the components, but instead references their lengths and the angle between them. So it's a more geometric formula. Okay. okay. So let's take a look at just a short uh, computational example. So let's say we have two vectors.
Okay. And let's say that uh, we wanted to find the angle between these two vectors u and b. So to find the angle between the two of them, uh, we can reference this formula here. So let's start by computing the uh, norms of u and v as well as their dot product. So the norm of u is going to be the square root of 3 squared plus negative 1 squared plus 2 squared, which will be square root of 14. If we do the norm of v next. So that's going to be square root of 0 squared plus 4 squared plus negative 3 squared for a total of square root of 25, which would be 5. Okay. We look at the dot product between u and v. So dot product will be 3 times 0 plus negative 1 times 4, so minus 4, plus 2 times negative 3, so minus 6, for a total of negative 10. Okay. So now applying the geometric formula for dot product that we have up here, the dot product, negative 10, would be equal to the norm of u times the norm of v times the cosine of the angle between the two vectors. So cosine data would be negative 10 over 5 root 14. And if we need to solve for the angle data, then data would simply be the inverse cosine or the arc cosine of, I guess, negative 10 over 5 is negative 2 over root 14. Okay. All right. So, uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the consequences now of this formula relating the dot product to the angle between two vectors. So first I uh, want to uh, take a look at what the sign of the dot product represents. So whether the dot product is positive or negative, what does that tell us about the two vectors? Okay. So here I've drawn uh, two pictures. In this first picture with vectors u and v, we have an acute angle between them. So an angle between 0 and 90 degrees. So when the angle is acute, the vectors u and v, uh, they kind of point towards the same direction. Uh, they're not pointing in exactly the same direction, but uh, for instance, in this picture, they kind of point towards the right, so you know, roughly the same direction. Uh, when that's the case, uh, when the angle is between 0 and pi over 2, so it's an angle in the first quadrant, uh, we know that cosine is positive in that first quadrant. And looking at this formula here, if cosine is positive, that's going to make the whole dot product positive overall. Okay. So when the dot product is positive, the two vectors, they tend to point towards the same direction. Okay. In contrast, here I've got a picture where 
the angle is an obtuse angle, meaning it's between 90 degrees and 180 degrees. It's a vector in the, oh, sorry, it's an angle in the second quadrant, okay, between pi over 2 and pi radians. When the angle is obtuse, the vectors u and v, they point more in opposite directions as opposed to pointing more towards the same direction, okay? So when the angle is obtuse uh, in the second quadrant, we know that cosine is negative in the second quadrant. And if cosine is negative, that's going to make the whole dot product negative now. Okay. So if the dot product is negative, it's an obtuse angle. And the vectors, they tend to point more in opposite directions. Okay. So... Uh, just a summary, they point in roughly the same direction. The dot product is positive. If they point more in opposite directions, the dot product is negative. Okay. Uh, next up, uh, talking about orthogonality. Uh, so, two vectors are orthogonal to each other if the angle between them is pi over 2 or 90 degrees. Uh, I guess another word for this would be perpendicular, right? So uh, orthogonal, perpendicular, they both refer to the vectors making an angle of 90 degrees between each other. Yeah. Now cosine of pi over 2 happens to be equal to 0. So when the angle is pi over 2, cosine of pi over 2 is 0. That makes the dot product itself equal to 0, according to our formula there. Okay. So one of the key properties of dot product then is that two vectors u and v are going to be orthogonal if and only if their dot product is equal to 0. Okay. And then here, I'll just make a quick note that the zero vector uh, is considered to be orthogonal to every vector. Okay. Uh, just so that this statement remains valid, because uh, uh, no zero dot product with anything will be zero. Uh, so to make uh, this statement hold for all vectors, we want to consider zero to the zero vector to be orthogonal to everything. Okay. But this is uh, very important that we can check that two vectors are orthogonal by simply checking if the dot product is zero. As a small uh, application of uh, the dot product being zero, uh, that being indicative of orthogonality, I wanted to talk a little bit about projections right now. Uh, so if you are taking uh, 2414, 2419, or 2415, uh, I think you guys are, have started this semester uh, reviewing vectors. And you guys have probably talked about the uh, dot product between two vectors. You may have also talked about uh, the projection of a vector onto another vector. So I thought I would talk a little bit about that in this video, just to um, expand on uh, this little section on orthogonality right now. Okay. Now it turns out that later on in this semester, uh, roughly around the time of the second exam, you guys will probably be talking about projections uh, much more in depth. Uh, you'll be going uh, much more deep into the topic of projections than any of your calculus courses will have touched upon. Okay. So it's, I think it's good to uh, give a little introduction to that right now, and then we'll get more into it uh, in a couple 
months from now, okay? So I'm gonna draw a picture here. So let's say here's a vector u. Uh, well, let's do it like this. Let's call this vector a. And then let's say here, I've got another vector which we'll call b. Okay. So I'm going to drop a perpendicular line down from b to a, like such. And then here we've got uh, this vector which I'm drawing in blue here. So this vector is kind of like the shadow of B along A. Uh, this vector, uh, I'm going to call it P. Okay. Let me switch colors, actually. I'll switch back to black. Okay. So this vector P is... Uh, often referred to as the projection of B onto A. And uh, common notation for this, so it's projection of B onto A. Okay. All right, and there is a uh, formula for this projection vector. So I'm gonna go ahead and talk about that formula. Now, notice that the vector P, uh, since it lies along uh, the same line as vector A, that means that P, the projection vector, must be a scalar multiple of A, okay? So we make this observation that P is equal to uh, some scalar C times vector A. And to figure out what this scalar C is, uh, I want to make use of the fact that we have this third vector here in green, which is perpendicular to A, and this vector uh, connecting from P to B like that. Uh, this is, again, we've talked about this before. This would just be the difference between B and P, so it's vector B minus P there. So uh, since vector B minus P is orthogonal to vector A, okay. well, we know that two vectors are orthogonal when their dot product is equal to zero. Okay, and what I'm going to do right now with this uh, equation is I'm going to substitute CA in for P. So this becomes P minus CA dot product with A must be equal to zero okay. because of this uh, orthogonality condition here. And if we use the distributive property of the dot product, uh, this gives us b dot a. Okay. Minus, and then we distribute the a again. It's c times a dot a must equal zero. And uh, we can actually solve for c in this equation. So if we subtract 
uh, b.a or a.b to the other side. And then to solve for c, we will divide both sides by negative a dot a. So we get this formula that c is a dot b over a dot a. Okay. And if we take that expression for c and plug it back into this equation, we got that the projection vector p, or the projection of b onto a, is given by the formula uh, c, which was a scalar, was a dot b over a dot a, okay. times vector a, OK? All right, so then just uh, sort of a quick recap of that. So the projection was a scalar multiple of A uh, from this picture here. Using the fact that B minus P is orthogonal to A, uh, meaning that their dot product is zero, we managed to solve for what the scalar C has to be. So I plugged this formula into here for C. And that gave us the following formula for the projection of B onto A. So those of you who um, are in one of the Cal 2 or Cal 3 courses, you may have seen that formula. So that's a little proof of how that formula works, OK? And later on this semester, you'll learn how to project your vector onto and not another vector, but onto a plane and onto other higher dimensional objects. Uh, so we'll get to that uh, later on. Uh, I wanted to mention just a couple more properties of, a couple more consequences of the connection between dot product and the angle between two vectors. Uh, the next consequence I wanted to highlight is the uh, CBS inequality. Uh, so CBS stands for uh, Cauchy, Bunyakovsky, and Schwartz. Uh, oftentimes people, uh, sadly, will leave out Bunyakovsky, and they will simply refer to this as the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. But uh, let's see what this inequality says. So here's our formula relating dot products to angles. Okay. So if I apply the absolute value to both sides of this equality, then we get that the absolute value of the dot product is the norm of u times the norm of v and times the absolute value of cosine theta. Now, uh, we know that the absolute value of cosine is always no more than 1. So because this is no more than 1 altogether, uh, that means that the absolute value of u dot v is no more than the norm of u times the norm of v times 1, because okay? 1 is the largest that this absolute value of cosine could be. And of course, uh, multiplication by 1 does nothing, so if I just erase that, uh, this is the CBS inequality. So the absolute value of the dot product of u and v is 
no more than the normal v times the normal v. Okay. <clears throat> And there's another equal inequality that I also wanted to highlight, which is this triangle inequality here. Okay, so uh, to see what the triangle inequality is, let me do just a quick computation. I'm going to look at the norm of u plus v squared right now. So the norm of v plus v squared, uh, we know that the norm of a vector squared is the dot product of that vector with itself. And when we have an expression like this, we know that we can FOIL it. So we'll get u dot u, which is the norm of u squared plus u dot v plus v dot u, which will give us plus 2 u dot v. And then we get plus v dot v, which is the norm of v squared. OK. Now, uh, we know that the dot product is no more than the norm of u times the norm of v. So that what we have here is going to be less than or equal to norm u squared plus norm v squared plus norm u norm b. Okay. This, so this is less than or equal to this. So altogether, this is less than or equal to this. And then here, though, you'll notice that this is actually a perfect square. So that is actually uh, just the norm of u plus the norm of v, all squared, OK? Or let's write it like this. Yep. So therefore, what's the uh, takeaway from this? So on the left, we started with the norm of u plus v squared. And at the end, we find that it's less than or equal to norm u plus norm v squared. Okay. And if we square root both sides, we get the norm of u plus v is less than or equal to the norm of u plus the norm of v. Okay. So this is known as the triangle inequality. Although you won't really be doing much with the triangle inequality in this class, uh, I thought it was worth highlighting anyways. Uh, the triangle inequality is quite possibly the most important inequality in all of mathematics. So it uh, just didn't seem right to uh, not mention it, uh, even though you're not going to do much with it in this class. Okay. Okay. Uh, the reason why we call it the triangle inequality is because, uh, as you know, vectors u and v, when connected head to tail, there's some forms of third edge of this triangle. 
So actually, this inequality uh, reflects a uh, well-known uh, fact about triangles that the length of one edge of a triangle is always less than or equal to the sum of the lengths of the other two edges. Uh, in fact, for a triangle, it's actually always strictly less. Okay. Now this video has gotten pretty long, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, move on to the last topic, which is just about matrix vector multiplication. And to start this topic off, I wanted to look at the following example. So is the vector 2, 3 a linear combination of the vectors 1, 1, and 2, 2? So to solve this problem, what we could do is form a linear combination of 1, 1, and 2, 2. Set that equal to vector 2, 3. And then we'll try to solve for the scalars x and y to see if this is possible or not. Okay. Now if I uh, read off the components of both sides, we get x plus 2y equals 2, and then we get x plus 2y equals 3. So we convert it to the system of equations here. OK, now, it's uh, pretty clear looking at this system of equations that there is going to be no solution. Uh, simply because it's not possible for x plus 2y to be equal to 2 and at the same time to be equal to 3. Uh, 2 is not equal to 3, so it's, that's not possible. Okay? So there's no solution. Uh, meaning the answer to this question would be no. Uh, 2, 3 is not a linear combination of the vectors 1, 1, and 2, 2, OK? Another way that you can think about this problem is the following. If I plot the vectors 1, 1 and 2, 2, okay. you see that the vectors 1, 1 and 2, 2, they only, well, they both lie on a line, so they only span a line. Then the vector 2, 3 does not lie on that line, it sticks out of it. So because it does not lie, lie on the line uh, spanned by the two vectors, that's why uh, it is not a linear combination of them. Okay. Now, upon a closer examination of this system of equations, uh, notice that the, the variables x and y, okay? So the variables are important because that's what we're trying to solve for. But when you think about whether the system of equations has a solution or not, actually the, the variables x and y were uh, rather irrelevant, okay? The only thing that really mattered was the coefficients on the left and the numbers on the right, okay? 
uh, to get a better sense for why the variables don't matter, just uh, consider the fact that instead of using x and y, we could have used any other two letters, a and b, uh, r and s, p and q, and so forth. The variables would have no effect on whether the system has a solution or not. Whether the, solution, whether the system of equations has a solution depends entirely on the coefficients and the right-hand side only. Okay. So because of that observation, uh, that's maybe one reason why one might consider trying to rewrite a system of equations in a form where the variables are separated from the coefficients. like such, okay? Uh, because uh, the variables are kind of not too important, uh, if you will, and we're thinking about the solvability of the system. So pushing them off to the side, focusing just on the coefficients and the numbers on the right-hand side, uh, that seems kind of convenient to be able to do so in the notation. So that's one reason why you might consider trying to rewrite it uh, in a form such as this. Okay. Now, notice here that we have what looks like a product between a matrix and a vector. So we've got this matrix vector multiplication going on here. I guess, by the way, uh, a matrix just refers to a rectangular array of numbers like this, okay? So uh, this then leads us to uh, want to uh, talk about how to multiply a matrix with a vector, okay? And this example kind of already answers that question uh, how should we multiply a matrix and a vector together? Well, we would want this product to be equivalent to the left-hand side of our system of equations. Or, if you will, we'd want the matrix vector multiplication to be equivalent to what we have on the left-hand side over here. Okay, so what do we have comparing the two of them? This over here is just a linear combination of the columns of our matrix. And with that kind of observation, uh, we can now formally define what matrix vector multiplication is. Okay. So matrix vector multiplication, we want to define it so that the product gives us a linear combination of the columns of the matrix, OK? So if we have a matrix A, and let's say its columns are vectors A1, A2, et cetera, to An. So again, these vectors represent the entire columns of A, all right? And then let's say we have a vector x with components x1 through xn. Then we define the product between matrix A and vector x as this linear combination, x1 times the first column of A plus x2 times the second column of A, et cetera, down to uh, Xn times the nth column of A, OK? And just extremely important to note that uh, 
by this definition here, matrix vector multiplication forms a linear combination of the columns of A. Okay. I really cannot overstate how important this little fact actually is. Okay. I will literally be repeating this fact like over and over and over again throughout the semester, at least up until maybe past the second exam, then I might uh, finally stop having to mention this result. Okay. So it's a very simple fact, but very important to know. So please keep that in mind. All right. So let's consider just a small example of multiplying a matrix with a vector. So I'm just going to create a random matrix on the spot with some numbers. Okay. So right now this matrix, let's see here, it's a it's a three by four matrix. It's a three rows, four columns. Okay. So these are the rows, then the columns. All right. So if a matrix has uh, n columns. And we want to multiply it with a vector. That vector must have n components. So with four columns here, I'm going to create a vector x with four components. And with that, let's just do a little practice multiplying matrix A with vector x. So using our definition here, so the product is going to be uh, x1 times the first column of A. So I'm going to take the first component of x times the first column of A. Next, we're going to do plus the second component of x, which is 0 times the second column of A, okay. plus, now we take the third component of X, which is negative 3, times the third column of A. Then we're going to take uh, the last component of X, multiply it with the last column of A. And then if we just crunch all the numbers, you get 4 plus 0 minus 12 is 15. 8 plus 0 plus 6 plus 5. 12 plus 0, minus 3, minus 5. So if I did the arithmetic correctly, uh, that would be the product of A and X. OK. So I'll say a couple of things. So. <clears throat> Here, uh, this way of multiplying a matrix with a vector by forming a combination of the columns and then adding everything up. So again, this is a very important fact, but it's maybe a little bit tedious to, for uh, the actual uh, computation. Okay. So 
there is another way of uh, looking at things. So another way to think about how to multiply a matrix and a vector. So uh, notice that in this example, the first component, so this is seven, where did that seven come from? Well, we took the components of x, so the four, zero, negative three, five, and then we multiplied each of them with the components of the first row of A. So four and one, zero and negative two, negative three and four, four and negative three. We had the five and the three, so five and three. And if you think about what that uh, sum of products represents, notice that's basically like a dot product, right? It's actually like the dot product between the first row of A, of the A, uh, yeah, of the matrix A, sorry, uh, dot product with X. Likewise, when you look at the computation that you did in the second row, if you will, it was essentially the second row of A dot product with vector x. And likewise, if you take a look at how we got the number four here at the end, essentially it was taking vector x and doing the dot product with the third row of A. Okay. So uh, this observation is a general fact about multiplying a matrix and a vector. So in general. The ith component of the product AX is equal to the ith row of A thought of as a vector uh, dot product with vector X. Okay. So let's do just another example with this new perspective in mind. So I'll create a matrix A with some numbers. Let's create a vector X also with some numbers. So let's try computing the product A and X by doing dot products between the rows of A and vector X, okay? Let's start by taking the first row of A and dotting it with X. So we're gonna get two times negative three is negative six plus zero times four, uh, minus, or well, plus negative one times negative one. That gives us negative five for the first entry. Take the second row of A, dot product with X. It's gonna be negative three plus eight, minus three for a total of two. And lastly, the third row of A, dot product with X, it's gonna be positive nine 
minus 4, minus 4, or a total of 1. OK? All right, so to compute matrix A times vector x, you have the option of doing the dot products between the rows of A and vector x. You also have the option of forming a linear combination of the columns of A. Okay. For computational purposes, I think the uh, rows dot product with x is more efficient, but I still must emphasize how important it is that matrix vector multiplication forms a linear combination of whoops, the columns of A. OK, all right. Now, the definition of matrix vector multiplication, I motivated it by uh, looking at a system of equations. So I just wanted to uh, emphasize that connection now that whenever you have a, a system of equations, I'm just going to make one up uh, on the spot right now. Okay, uh, that any system of equations can be converted into a matrix equation of the form AX equals B. Okay. Where matrix A stores the coefficients of the left-hand side. Vector x is the vector that stores all the variables in it. And then vector b represents that right-hand side. Okay. So yeah, every system of equations can be written in the form ax equals b. And uh, in so much as a matrix A times vector x is equivalent to forming a linear combination of the columns of A. And in so much as how this is basically equivalent to what you have on the left hand side here, uh, that's how you can see that these are all kind of the, uh, different ways of representing the same thing, OK? All right. And this video has been going on for a very long time, but I'm not finished just yet. I want to go over one final thing, OK? So I just want to talk about one small advantage or one small piece of insight that we can get by writing a system of equations in this form ax equals b, OK? So let's consider the simplest uh, linear equation. Well, linear system of equations. Okay. Uh, so basically, let's consider the case where we have 
one equation and one unknown, okay? So here, everything is a scalar, ax equals b. This is such a simple equation uh, to solve for x. All we would do is divide both sides by a, or if you will, we would multiply both sides by a inverse, the reciprocal of a, if you will, 1 over a, OK? So now let's consider the general case. Well, we have you know some number of equations and unknowns, and we've talked about how we can express the equation in the form a x equals b. Well, if we were to try to draw an analogy to the uh, simplest scenario where we have one equation and one unknown, uh, it kind of suggests that maybe the solution to the equation ax equals b can somehow be represented as x equals a inverse b. Now, uh, here then, we that kind of introduces the idea of the inverse of a matrix. which is something that we will elaborate on uh, also in the near future, maybe in the next two to three weeks, if I had to guess. Uh, but at least there seems to be some idea that maybe the solution to AX equals B might have this kind of form, OK? And I'm just going to take a look at one final example. This is the very last thing I'm going to do in the video. Let's consider the following uh, system of equations. Okay, let's try to act so. Uh, it's kind of in the form AX equals B, where uh, again, A is the matrix of coefficients. Okay. And X and B, uh, X of course is just X1, X2, X3. And then in this example, B would just be B1, B2, B3. So let's actually try to solve for vector x right now uh, to see if uh, it maybe has uh, some kind of uh, form uh, a inverse times b, OK? Let's check that. So to solve this system of equations for uh, x1, x2, x3, uh, let's do the following. So I'm just going to number the equations right now. So I guess I did something similar in another example already in this review. Let me take equation one, and I'm going to just rearrange equation one as x3 equals x1 minus b1. OK? That's just a rearranging equation one. Likewise, I'm just going to rearrange equation two by isolating x2 as being uh, b2 minus x1, OK? And then I'm going to sub these into three. So now the third equation becomes 2x1 plus 2x2 plus 
x3 equals b3. And if I distribute, uh, let's see here. 2x1, it's going to cancel with the minus 2x1. We still have 2b2 plus x1 minus b1 equals b3. And if I solve for x1 right now, we get x1 is b1 minus 2b2 plus b3, OK? And then I'm going to sub that into these two. So now we're going to get x3 is x1. Minus b1. So the b1s will cancel. And then we have a, over here x2 is b2 minus x1. We know x1 is this. Let's uh, simplify a bit. So that's minus b1. b2 plus 2b2 for a total of 3b2. We're going to have minus b3. OK. So if we compare what we have for x over here, and let me copy what we have for x2 and x3. So here we have x2 it's minus b1 plus 3b2 minus b3. Then over here we have x3 is negative 2b2 plus b3. So those are the solutions, x1, x2, x3. And we can actually write this in a matrix vector form as x equals, here if I pull the coefficients of the b's, then this system of equations here, I can rewrite it in this form. And that is kind of reminiscent of x being a inverse b, OK? So talking about how the solution, we might guess uh, that it has that form. And at least in this particular example that we looked at, uh, our solution does seem to resemble that form. And uh, if that's the case, it seems to suggest that given this matrix A over here, uh, there, this example at least suggests that the inverse of A should be this matrix over here. Now that said, we haven't actually formally defined matrix inverse, so this is a little bit fuzzy. Okay? Uh, but we will get to it uh, in due time. All right. So that is all for this review. Uh, thank you for watching, and I hope you got something out of it.